The Safety Doc Podcast is brought to you in part by The 405 Media, ISS 24-7, and Sprigio.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Podcast 3 of The Safety Doc. I am The Safety Doc, David Proden, and today we will be talking about the infamous Milgram Electric Shock Experiment. So... Let me review for those of you who are new to the safety podcast. And boy, we've had a great turnout here the first couple of weeks. Um, but our format, a little bit about me. So I have a PhD from UW-Madison in Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. I completed my dissertation on analyzing high-stakes decision-making in safety situations in the military, healthcare, and education. Um, also work as a safety consultant, expert witness, number of other things. Um, and, and I am authoring uh, books on safety right now for Roman and Littlefield. Um, this is a weekly podcast which is hosted by the 405 Media. Some anecdotes. I'm going to share some lesser known facts or research and then we will talk about one headline that has to do with safety and then I'll do a little bit of a wrap-up. So first of all um, I want to give a shout out to the supporters of this podcast. It wouldn't be possible without the support of Sprigio, S-P-R-I-G-E-O dot com. Sprigio dot com with Joe out of Santa Barbara helping to keep schools safe across the United States with bullying reporting software, bullying education, threat input software, and just holding some of the most incredible um, high-level intellectual discussions with the top educators to work on school connectedness. So Sprigio.com. ISS 24-7. ISS 247.com based out of Florida. So um, I know they had to relocate a little while ago Saint Math or with uh, the Matthew uh, hurricane that came through. I talked to Scott Meyer um, out of ISS 40, 24 seven and said, what, what happened you know, to your facility? And he said, well, I think one of our deck chairs blew over. So they were spared the, the brunt of that. Um, ISS 24 seven providing a very, very uh, high end app based security for venues such as the National Football League and a number of NCAA um, arenas and stadiums. So uh, we are actually going to hear from Scott in an interview I conducted with him that I am producing into a two-part series for podcast four and five. And finally, the 405 Media, based out of Los Angeles, your talk alternative. What an all-star lineup that the 405 Media has. And... They just happen to bring me in on the 9 p.m. Um, slot from 9 to 10, Monday through Thursday. Bill Mitchell is before me, I think, with his 88,000 followers and, and just his, um, what I, I think, brilliant presentation. Um, but just up and down the dial, uh, the old, what is it, up and down the, the dial, WKRP Cincinnati. For those of you who remember, kind of in the age here of the safety doc, but um, the 405 media. Um, you're going to hear, hear the truth, what's actually happening. And it's very captivating, very interesting stuff from economy um, to, to politics to just life in general. Hey, you know, I don't, I listen to podcasts. I don't listen to TV and the mainstream media anymore. And I'm thankful for the 405 media. Tune in, listen to me, but do tune in a little bit earlier. Listen to Bill Mitchell, keep going, listen to the other broadcast. Um, I've always got it on, the 405 media. This is also available on YouTube for those of you who want to see me in person. I did wear a sport coat today. Uh, it's available on SoundCloud and you can RSS feed it so you can listen to all of my SoundCloud um, archives and any specials. And again, Monday through Thursday, 9 p.m. Pacific on the 405 Media. And the 405 Media subsequently will place this broadcast on iTunes. So a lot of ways that you can listen. Um, I have an hour slot for this show, so I will 
probably be about 50 minutes in uh, production, just so you can plan as you're listening for me. Um, you know that you have 50 minutes to get the information. A lot of people like to listen while they're in their cars. So hey, um, uh, da, da, da. I, I'm on Twitter at safety PhD at safety PhD the safety doc. And I've increased my uh, Twitter analytics significantly, but please go on and follow me. Uh, I do tweet um, a few times a day and always tweet out relevant original information. I'm not uh, too much into retweets, so what you hear from me uh, is largely going to be authentic. If there is something very important to retweet, it will be retweeted from the safety doc to you. But please, please follow me on my different platforms and I do have a blog on WordPress that I'm probably going to move over to a different um, host site, but all the posts will remain there. Uh, very interesting if you are interested in safety, which you should be. Personal safety, and then my podcast is about not only personal safety, keeping you safe, but keeping your family safe, keeping your children safe. Um, I was a school administrator for a number of years. I know how important and how complicated that process is. So I'm going to help you navigate that and I'm going to help you work through the rhetoric because we know that a lot of safety and just school safety is, is based on rhetoric, based on hysteria. I'm going to get you through that to the facts, to what really matters and what can make and keep you safe. So let us start today with an anecdote. Um, I, I, have a, I have a rather long commute, interstate commute uh, to, to work and one of the things that I've noticed is they're putting up more uh, digital signs. When I say they, the, the highway department, putting up more digital signs to alert you, um, you know, this many minutes until highway, you know, 12 or whatever. So, um, you know, that it's useful. But what they've done now is, is I think they've hired uh, a descendant of Ernest Hemingway because it's become a little cheeky and, and more narrative. So there'll be things like, hey, you know, don't be a turkey drive safe and get to your destination on Thanksgiving. So, you know, okay. Um, or, you know, ha have a great day. I can take that, but I don't need, you know, I, I, I don't need to kind of get somebody's uh, improv every day on my way to and from work. Um, and, and they're starting to get more lengthy. That's the thing, you know. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, the the purpose here is to really be watching the road, like not not to read this person's, you know, this 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 person's little, um, you know, blog that they've got going up there um, above me on the highway. So uh, just just kind of it's just striking me from a safety perspective of, um, you know, why in the world do you want people to keep their eyes off the road? I can understand relevant information, but again, it's getting to be almost like, like someone is, is creating their own blog, their own personal way to reach thousands and thousands of people a day. Pretty soon we'll probably see advertisements and things up there. I don't know. But um, anyway, I have a motto to the DOT with all of these new signs. My motto is, turn off the sign. Let me enjoy drive time. Okay? All right. That will fit on your sign, too. I've checked. I know the number of pixels it'll take. Um, so I, <laughs> I have a story to tell about when I was growing up and this is going to fit in to the Milgram electric shock studies, which is going to be the, the meat of this, this podcast. But when I was growing up, um, Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters was released in 1984, saw it in a theater, thought it was amazing. Thought it was amazing. I had a 10 speed bike. So, um, at the time, let's see, I think I was 12. So um, I had a 10 speed, 10 speed bike, and back then it was made all of metal. Not like today with the composite materials or even plastic. Like it was metal. The brakes were metal. The handlebars were metal. I mean, everything was metal. That's just the way that this bike was made. It's the way they used to make things. So um, I was a big fan of Ghostbusters. I designed my own Proton backpack with one of my friends. Looked pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I'll admit it. I took my 10 speed bike. And I bought conduit pipe. Conduit pipe is kind of like water pipe, but thinner. And if you if you hammer it down, you can flatten it on one end. So I could have a flattened end, but then I could kind of curve around the frame of my bike, with the supporting the wheels and just the, the other parts of the frame. And I would take hose clamps, 
tighten these things down. So it wasn't permanently like drilling through the frame and doing things like that. It was just attaching, tightening down all of these brackets. And I built this wooden platform to go out in front of this bike. There's a photo of it that exists somewhere up in my parents' house in a, in a photo album. Um, it's the only photo that I know of that exists of the Ghostbusters bike. Uh, if it was, if you imagine the Pee Wee Herman bike, it was kind of like that. And I would say even cooler. Um, so I had this huge platform on the front of my Ghostbusters bike. I had a CB radio, CB radio, which actually I still had, I had a CB radio when I was in high school. Um, I had uh, antennas on the side of my duster with flags, and my handle was Flag Buddy. So I actually cut a hole in the dash of my car to install my CB. Would not recommend that today. Um, but... At a CB radio, everything's battery operated. So, you know, um, and then a number of, of, of kind of headlights coming off on the front, um, lights on the back, just everything you can imagine. But I needed red lights, you know, like the Ghostbuster, the Ecto-1 had all the blue lights, the red lights, everything going was really cool. So how in the world at 12 years old are you going to get like actual authentic, like, you know, red lights that'd be on top of a fire truck or police car? There's a way. You go to the J.C. Whitney catalog, which you could get at almost any Napa, any parts store. It's back before the Internet. You go into the catalog, you can order anything you need for a vehicle. And you piece through it, and it's like, hey, here's red lights, which you could just order back then. Um, now, you know, I'm 12 years old. I don't have a checkbook. So, and if I tell my mom and dad I'm going to order these red lights to put on this bike, there's no way that's happening. So I gather up my lawn mowing money and I go to the post office, get a postal order for JC Whitney and order these red lights. I don't exactly remember how when these things came in that I took them out and put them on the front of the bike without my parents asking, where'd you get this or what's this package from JC Whitney or whatever. I'm sure I just said I got this from a friend or whatever. But um, I was able then to take the CB radio, the red lights, and rewire everything, take it apart. And at 12 years old, I was like a prodigy with electricity and wiring a skill I no longer have today, um, as evidenced by last year trying to rewire part of my basement and having a call an electrician who said, um, yeah, don't ever try to do this again. But um, I had I had a, a, a way to wire everything up to a component where I had toggle switches and I could turn everything on and off, and it was really cool. Um, so, yeah, the lights, and especially at night, man, this thing looked awesome. This, the Ghostbusters bike was rocking. Remember, this is like 1984. So um, I have this, it, it looked just awesome. Um, but it takes a lot of juice to run something like that. Back then, you could buy a headlight and a taillight for a bike that would operate off of a generator, which would basically be a gear that you would click, and the gear would make contact with the rubber part of your wheel, and as your wheel moved, the little gear would spin and generate electricity, which would power the light. They never really worked that well. And then as soon as you slowed down and got dim, and then, you know, eventually you put a lot of wear on the tire. Um, and if you stopped, then the light went out. So, but anyway, uh, I bought a number of these generators, like, you know, a, a lot of them. And I had it configured where I could activate, and these, these generators would kick in, they would make contact with the tire and then basically come up and power my entire system that I had going there. So I had battery, but I also basically then would run it off of the electricity that's generating off the wheel, you know, so my red lights and all of that off my wheels. Now, I really put a lot of drag on the bike. <laughs> you can imagine, for one. So to do that, you had to have the bike going before you could click that on, because otherwise it just wasn't happening. Um, but once you once you had that, you had you had the power you wanted. Now, granted, I didn't I didn't really go through all the tests. I probably should have on this to have any really type of electrical knowledge outside of just looking at you know the, what the wires look like, um, a little bit of understanding the schematics. So I take this bike out, I get it done, and this I mean my friends are looking at this thing and they're looking at me like this thing's incredible. So I'm like, yeah, my Ghostbusters bike. And it was heavy. I had it pretty balanced, like if you were on, if you're driving like center, but if you start to tilt, you know, this thing was maybe like an extra 60 pounds of weight, uh, you know, quite dangerous. Um, but hey, you know, when you're 12, stuff like that is awesome. Took it up to a ballpark. 
a block from my house and leaned it against uh, one of the one of the buildings where they kept the equipment. Um, and it's kind of funny, you know, I, I'm thinking of the ballpark because I see it now, you know, from time to time. And in it, its update, it has a steel fence, has an electronic scoreboard, new bleachers dug up. You know, when I was there playing Little League, it was a snow fence and half of it was knocked down. There was an active railroad track five feet in back of the, of the right field fence. Um, and instead of a score, well, they had a scoreboard. It was a big wooden scoreboard and they would hire some kid like for five bucks a game to go out there and literally hang the numbers kind of like at Wrigley Field up on the scoreboard. Um, and, and yeah, and the dugouts honestly looked like bomb shelters. They were like, you know, 18 inch thick concrete that there was a concrete company in town. I think they donated these things. Um, since they've torn them down, I don't know why. I, I don't even know how you tore these things down. They were like, it's built again, like a bomb shelter, but, um, but anyway, everyone's admiring this bike, and they're like, take it for a run, take it for a run, take, you know, the inaugural ride. So I lived on uh, in a town that was built on a hill, almost like on a mountain, I mean, really steep hill. Go up to the top of the hill, every, you know, friends, people are watching down at the bottom for me to come down with this bike, kick in the generators, throw on the lights and everything, and wow. So, you know, sounds good, right? I get up to the top of the hill, I'm going down, and... Uh, decide it's time kick in the generators and all of a sudden boom it's like back to the future with the delorean approaching you know what is it 88 miles an hour and um, electricity starts to, to pulsate you know through the systems and it, it instantly kind of overwhelms the systems and what happens next and this actually happened You're, there might be scientists that are going to listen to this people are going to say no this couldn't have happened because the bike is grounded and all of that this, this actually this happened okay the bike became electrified. It became electrified. And as I would grab the, as I grab the brakes, which were metal, I would get shocked. Like the voltage would be going through me. And it's only speeding up and speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. And I really have no way to stop this bike because if I grab onto this thing, I mean, it's been, it's shooting all of this electricity through me. And that's only part of the issue. So the bike starts to gain speed, which then all of a sudden starts to make it very unstable when you have, you know, probably on the front, you know, an extra 60 pounds and starts to lean a little bit. You know how the roads were back then, you know, the blacktop where they just incorporated stones, which were like, you know, three inches or across. I mean, it's old school. So wipe out the Ghostbuster bike. Uh, tremendous wipe out. Now, I walked away pretty good. Bike was basically destroyed. I remember pieces of the bike, I think like the red lights, you know, would roll almost like a block further after the initial in impact of wiping this thing out. And I, I know the exact corner, like I know exactly where this thing, I, I, I lost the bike. And I think the bike ended up hitting a pole and it's just crazy. I, again, I was, I was okay. Uh, but that was the end of the Ghostbusters bike. And um, my friends helped me carry it back to my house. Uh, yeah. So, um, and then, at the same time, they're like, are you okay? And then they're saying, that was really, really pretty cool. So um, talking about electricity is going to bridge us in to this uh, article here about the Milgram Electric Shock Study. So I'm going to talk about this article from The Atlantic um, called Rethinking One of Psychology's Most Infamous Experiments. It's written by Carrie Rom, C-A-R-I-R-O-M-M, -M, January 28th, 2015. You might say it's a little bit old, but actually this article seemed to resurface and make its way around um, during election time. And I think the reason it did was um, to get people thinking about, are, are you being coerced into making decisions? Are you um, and, and how do you how do you stand stand up for what you believe is is right and go against um, you know maybe a group mentality? Uh, I'm not really sure, but anyway, I, I I've read the article. I've been a big fan of of Milgram's of Stanley Milgram's work, um, and the article. Uh, I think the Atlantic does does a horrible job in this article. I, for, first of all, I don't really even know what the article accomplishes or tries to accomplish. Um, it basically has a sentence at the top saying, um, or two sentences, in the 1960s, Stan Re Stanley Milgram's electric shock study showed that people will obey even the most abhorrent 
of orders, but recently researchers have begun to question his conclusions and offer some of their own, which really, like one researcher kind of did that in here, and another just like flat out just, you know, made debunked in a, in a childish way um milgram but like it's 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 not in here i mean this is this is like a compo it's like a pinterest board is what this is that's that's printed uh this is this is a ho this horrible work here atlantic this is embarrassing but what happens is people read stuff like this if they read through it, i mean it has some entertaining value because it just pulls data and pulls little snippets and little quotes snipey quotes from people from all over the place tries to piece it together in some kind of article which has no rhyme or reason to it whatsoever. Um, it, you know, at one point even even says, in spite of, you know, saying Milgram and, you know, all, all the flaws and why this is, is, isn't is good and, and you know, his research, uh, you know, it's still kind of the gold standard. Like, we still go, we say, well, look, you don't, you can't have it both ways. Okay, so... Um, it kind of, so when you read this, it, it gives you the impression this is what happens. People like the Atlantic is not a research magazine. I don't even know what it really what it really does. I've listened to other um, uh, other podcasters who have challenged the the Atlantic and, and some of their writing, um, but I, I'm telling you that this isn't this isn't a good article. And but we're going to talk about it because um, again, this is the type of thing that frames out what people think when they think about safety. Uh, when they when they think about personal safety, when they think about group safety, and the manipulation that happens through media, the manipulation that happens through an article like this, which is not a research article, it's, it gives the appearance somewhat of a research article, or that it is pulling parts of research um, to support some kind of construct or theme. It, it doesn't do that. It just kind of confuses you. And what I what I think it does. Um, I think it, the purpose of this article probably just is to discredit uh, Milgram's, um, uh, you know, findings of saying that, yes, I mean, most people will do what they're told by an authority figure. So, and maybe by doing that in the context of doing that, and if you're doing that in a socialized context, is um, kind of subtly telling people, you know, you've, you've got to challenge what, what government is telling you. So yeah, I'm, yeah, so yeah, I'm reading into that. Um, but so what, um, let, let's, let's talk about first the study. So the Milgram study is, is, is it's infamous, um, because, well, happened in, in 1961, actually, you know, through the, through the 60, but ni 1961. So, Stanley Milgram uh, paid men four, $4 to participate in a study. And what the study involved, it, he said, hey, we're going to look at um, examining memory and learning. Uh, that wasn't really accurate. So um, what, was, what he was doing, I mean, so that was to get people to, to participate in the study. He was actually studying um, how people would follow directions given by an authority figure, even when those directions resulted um, uh, in, in what would be perceived as harming somebody, bringing harm to somebody else. So uh, let's let's imagine participants were assigned a role of teacher. So right here, if I am the teacher, you know, I'm getting paid my four dollars to come in to the study. Um, the researcher would observe me. So imagine that person standing off to my my side, maybe with a clipboard, and and then giving me directions on what to do. Um, so I'm in in front of me. Um, what I have is I have a dial and it's marked slight shock on the left. And as you turn the dial, it gets all the way over to severe danger shock, you know, so that's, and I'm directed to turn it to a certain level and then administer a shock in an adjacent room. I can't see this person, but I can hear them is, is the, um, basically the academic or the, or the learner, the person who's, who's performing this academic task. So when they get it wrong, I'm being directed then to administer an electric shock to them. And what Milgram was looking at is um, would people want to administer electric shocks and would they administer if it was slight? You know, once you got up a little higher on the dial, would they continue to administer? Um, would they, and just when would they back out of this or would they go all the way? You know, what would happen? Um, and it was surprising, very surprising. Um, we'll talk about that. So, um, Eventually, 65% uh, of the people that participated 
participated in the study, in my, in my role, the role of administering the shock, 65% went all the way up to the max. So they were told by the authority, turn it all the way up to severe danger and zoom, you know, issue that shock. And when the person would do that in the other room, that, that learner, that other, that, that person you didn't see would be yelling, you know, stop, you know, you're killing me. I, I can't take this anymore, you know, begging for mercy. So they would, and they'd be doing that all the way up, you know, as the shocks had increased. Um, so you, you can imagine, but 65% of the people just, you know, they kept going, just, just people who participated in the study. Um, so you go back to that and, and why that was significant at the, it's, it's still significant, but what Milgram was doing was countering the, um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but it, in the Nuremberg trials, it was the defense of, I was just following orders and, you know, using that defense. So Milgram was, was challenging that of saying, you know, really do people do, I mean, how, how openly do they just follow orders from authority figures? Now, granted, you know, it's a little bit different in this case because, well, it's a lot different in this case because in, in Nazi Germany, if you don't follow the order, you know, you're, you're going to get introduced to, you know, a lead from a gun. Um, but in this case, you know, you have, you, you can just stand up and leave, you know, hey, the four bucks is yours no matter what. Um, so it's not the same. You don't have the same stakes and you don't have that same, you know, ideology, government ideology around you and all of all of those factors and things like that, too. So but it was but it's very interesting because you'd have to think if you're if you're participating, 65 percent of the people are, are going all the way to the top in this study that under Nazi Germany, when people were saying I was just following orders, there was and the part that is included in that is you have a peer group or almost kind of like the mob mentality, which you're, you're more likely to do things because your responsibility is diffused. Um, maybe, maybe that was accurate. It doesn't justify it. It doesn't justify it, but maybe that statement was accurate. Um, that doesn't mean though that people were not aware of the, the horrors and the travesties that were being committed. Um, but it did mean that they were, they, that they were following orders, we're not going to act against those orders because then, um, you know, their own life would be in jeopardy. So, you know, if you're thinking of the college students, you're like, how in the world would college students, or, or the people participating, they weren't necessarily college students in the study, um, you know, why would they, why would 65% turn the juice all the way up and, and zap? Well, they're probably thinking, you know, this is a controlled environment. I'm at a college. The college isn't going to kill people. Um, so, you know, th there's got to be safeguards in here. So they're just assuming that this person knows what they're doing. They've got a, re you know, uh, PhD. So they would go with it. Um, and I think, I think that's, what, that's what happened. So, um, but we have some revisionist, what I call revisionist research going on here through this article, through the Atlantic, uh, basically trying to reinterpret the methodology and the findings of the study to arrive at new conclusions. For, you, you can't do that for a number of reasons. Um, it's, a, it's a very flawed and dangerous approach to qualitative research. This is qualitative research, meaning that you have interviews, you have videos, you have transcripts. That's quantitative. You know, if you go back and look at a set of numbers and somebody miscalculated a number um, wrong, a mistaken entry or something like that, that, that's correctable and it should be corrected in research. Um, but if it's qualitative, that's completely different because that has a strong subjective nature to um, whatever the, um, you know, the researcher is identifying as they're coding out their findings as what they're finding relevant to their research findings. So you can't put your mind in the mind of that researcher and try to, to, to figure that out. You also, um, you also have a completely different context. Um, so you, you, can't, you can't magically put your, yourself back into that 1961 environment and understand everything that was going on. Also, you know, what was going on in, in the environmental context of, you know, you had um, the Cold War scare, you had strong obedience to government, you just came out of, you know, the McCarthyism and, and things like that. So, um, Again, and people trusted, trusted universities, trusted professors. So 
you, you can't go back and talk about the study and kind of pull from the boxes that Milgram had and, and re-piece these things together and come up with different different conclusions because you don't have the context, you don't have the situation. And again, the people participating in the study, okay, remember, I mean, they're there for maybe an hour and then they're going back to whatever their life was. Um, and so it's a flawed study. One, it's unable to account for the greater context of the study. For example, it, you know, it occurred when people trust, had a large trust in government. Two, all research, um, get, all researchers gather data. Every researcher gathers data. They analyze it, and then there's parts of that data that they deem doesn't support their, their construct. It doesn't mean um, you take out research that doesn't, that doesn't support your claim, but for example, I was, when I was doing my research, one of the things that started to show up in my transcripts, uh, people were talking about decision fatigue or, you know, that after they make a decision, it would take them sometimes up to a day to kind of a high stakes decision. Um, it would, a safety decision, you know, that, that, could, that could be life or death. It might take them a day to kind of get their baseline back where then they could reprocess and, and make another, you know, decision without being influenced and still kind of under the fog of that first decision. So that was an interesting phenomena that showed up, but it wasn't what I was researching. So I put that off to the side. So that did not show up in my findings and my, my discussion. I left that out. That's per perfectly fine to do. I mean, you can, you can do that and you should do that. Um, so the, yeah, it's, again, you know, those things that you can look at that Milgram had, you know, off in maybe, you know, his, his boxes, things he didn't, he didn't count, things that weren't incorporated. And you look and you say, well, here's parts that he left out. Well, I mean, they were left out for a reason. You don't bring things back in. It's, it, you don't take George Lucas, you don't go to his cutting room floor and grab a handful of clips and say, let's throw these in and now let's see what Star Wars looks like, okay? It doesn't work that way. Um, so, you know, um, Milgram certainly would have had data which wouldn't have, have been used in his, his research. And again, that's typical. But what's happening is there's an impl it, it's implied here through the article that by doing this, um, you are indicating then that um, something is purposely being being left out and that that information then should be reevaluated, reassessed, and then possibly you can have different outcomes to how you're interpreting Milgram's study. So again, and, and you, there's a piece, you, you don't know. I mean, maybe this wasn't included because on that day when they were doing studies, there was a fire drill and it threw off, you know, everyone had to leave and it threw something off. I mean, you don't know. It could have been something like that, right? So there's reasons. Um, so the the piece by the Atlantic explicitly states this is in large bold text. They actually make it stand out that uh, the ability to disobey toxic orders is a skill that can be learned like any other. All a person needs to do is learn what to say. All right. Uh, first of all, I don't know if that's I, I don't think that's accurate. I'll say I don't think that's accurate. Um, and. The other part is the Atlantic makes that statement and then does nothing to support it, does nothing to give the recipe of how then, if, if this, I mean, this would be earth shattering if you could just uh, infuse people with the magic words to say. And here's the part, like, you can have that, but you, then the person, the, you know, you, you can produce that, is the person that's listening going to process, process that? And is it going to make a difference to them? <laughs> So, um, you know, I, it's a completely irresponsible statement to come up with. And what they did is they harvested that from a, from a UW researcher um, who was working on his PhD in sociology. So nothing against that researcher, but um, it was not even a defendant study. And this is, this is where they pulled that out of, that this researcher was, was going through, um, you know, like a hundred plus hours of, of Milgram's um, recordings and things like that and, and finding different ways to, to interpret things and so forth and and saying, you know, maybe, maybe there's a way that, you know, you, you just need to articulate better as you go through this that, no, I don't want to participate in this. Well, here's the deal. 
This was done at a university. And if you're saying, ah, I'm feeling uncomfortable with giving this person a zap, a zap, you know, then just get up and leave, you know, just get up and leave. So I think it's really weak, really weak to make that, that correlation or relationship or whatever they're trying to do right there. Um, and again, nothing against the researcher from, from UW-Madison who was in the midst of his, his PhD on this, um, but his work was definitely used and leveraged by the Atlantic um, to, to, to excite the readership. Um, Rory Miller does a number of books. One is Conflict Communication, a number of publications. on. He, he's really, uh, you know, one of the best when it comes to how to use um, communication to, to best maneuver out of a safety situation. Uh, but with that said, um, you know, he's, his work is much different than, you know, saying, yeah, there's this key set of words that, you know, when the Nazis came knocking at your door and said, uh, hey, guess what? You are now enrolled in, in um, you know, in the Nazi party. Uh, it, you know, you, you, you couldn't pull out your, your script and say, um, no, here's, here's why I'm not, I'm not going to, to quote unquote join, um, you know. It's, it's such an injustice of the Atlantic, again, to indicate and, and imply, imply, it's a nuance, but it's there, that, you know, there, there was a choice to follow orders um, during World War II. And in, it, again, in the recruitment, in the enrollment, in the enlistment of people into the German military, uh, I am not condoning anything that was done. I'm talking about the process wasn't voluntary. It wasn't you, that you could talk your way out of it. And this magic set of words exists, and it's going to be revealed in this study, which it never was. Um, just, just crazy. So, uh, again, you know, you're, you're not people. You know, people were not subscribing World, World War II. It, it didn't mean they're subscribing to the ideology of of being a Nazi necessarily. They might want to live another day uh, for their family. They might believe that this is all going to be resolved. Um, you know, in time, things are things are going to go back to some whatever normalcy it is. But it's getting to tomorrow, uh, and that's not at all what was part of the Milgram study. Again, the Milgram study is somebody coming in for maybe an hour, participating in a study, and going back to their normal lives. They're coming in um, typically from a normal life, and they're they're exiting you know to a normal life. When I say normal, not a condition where the country is under war and, and food is scarce and things like that and and whatever. So. There's a school connection here, so I want to make the school connection. School shooters often try to recruit others. So if there is such a way to articulate and um, use communication, use language to then not uh, subject yourself as easily as a target to being recruited, um, there's benefit to that. So, but again, that's not talked about in the article. That's where the article could have made a, a nice jump over to a practical side of, of that. Um, once you engage in an act of school violence, especially if you feel compelled by an ideology, which uh, definitely was present at Columbine, you know, you continue uh, a cold, you know, coldly because you're abiding to the ideology at that time. And especially when there's more than one person uh, even and even just two, but you start to have the group mentality and the diffused responsibility. And we see this. We see this down at Freak Fest in Madison. Freak Fest in Madison. It doesn't happen so much uh, now, but, you know, five, ten years ago, uh, tens of thousands of people would get together on State Street for Halloween and called Freak Fest. And normal people who would go to their normal day jobs, you know, office jobs, whatever, would go crazy. Uh, you know, they'd be picking up garbage cans, trying to, you know, throw them through windows and things like this. And um, just because of that, that mob mentality, diffused responsibility and people getting caught up in that moment. So, um, so again, the article by, uh, the article we just talked about by the, the Atlantic, um, doesn't, it, it disregards, you know, that the context of the Milgram study was during 
during the Cold War. Right now we don't have the Cold War. There's assumption, you know, the people participating in that, the university wasn't going to bring, you know, harm to other people. You know, that was probably probably a given. I mean, most people coming into that study were, again, if you're, um, you know, thinking, trying to compare that to the Nuremberg trials, you know, that it, it just doesn't make sense. And the Milgram, the Milgram study was not recruiting membership. I mean, it's not like, okay, come join us, and now you're a member forever, and you're going to be part of this team. And maybe we're going to have a group, and we're going to have group decisions on whether or not we're going to administer shocks to people and all this. It wasn't a recruiting tool. On, you know, for an ongoing membership, like as if you would enroll in a military or, you know, something to that effect. Um, so again, I, I, I don't think you can draw these comparisons because you have a recruitment factor that was present in, you know, in the Nuremberg trials that was not present with Milgram studies. Milgram was, did a great job. I believe did a great job under, and under IRB approval. You couldn't do this stuff today, <laughs> and you couldn't do it, you know, shortly after the study because well, sometimes, I mean, he wasn't notifying participants. If I was a learner, I'm zapping people. He's not telling me on my way out. By the way, that was just all fake. So some of these people might have had psychological impact from that. The study was only cited a number of times. I think it's like 10 times in the first few years. And even in, in 2012, it was cited like a total of 60 times or something. It's a hot potato. Like a lot of, a lot of research are, are not going to cite that a lot um, and, and make connections to the Milgram study just because it, it is one of those things that it's like, okay, it was done. Um, here's what we learned from it. But like we could never do this again because of it's just an in, inhumane um study. So there was a there was a TV show, The Experimentalist, I believe it was called, um, with Peter Sarsgaard. Now, I was excited. I love the show. I thought it was actually going to be a series. So after I learned it was just a one-shot deal, I was kind of let down by that. Um, but it does, it talks about kind of a modern Milgram study, a covert thing uh, that the government does at a, at a university. It's made up. Um, but if you want to get more of a contemporary understanding of what I'm talking about here. So um, I, think, I, I think the Atlantic uh, completely um, missed on a, few, on a few areas with the study. One is they could have pointed out a significant gap in Milgram's study that was, you know, he used single subjects versus using a group. Um, what if he would have also um, used, used a, a group? So then I think you can go and maybe start to look at studies that, you know, have group decisions. When people are in a group, are they, what are they likely to decide? Now, I'm not talking necessarily like giving electric shocks and stuff, but how does a group decide versus an individual? Because we know there's a group thing. People try to come up with a consensus if you're in a group. People are less willing to, to stand out. I, I know that from my own research. Um, and then also... Um, that uh, I, I, I think, again, there's assumptions made to Milgram's study design, and that wasn't mentioned. Um, it just wasn't a good breakdown of, of here's, how he, here's how he set up his design. Here's how he formulated the questions that he would, you know, use. And here's the, uh, you know, the, the checks and balances, um, the other professionals that were reviewing, giving feedback on his work, um, you know, things like that. I just, I don't know. A lot, a lot of these pieces just missing from the story. These are things you want to understand with research. So um, the Atlantic stated Milgram's research has spawned countless spin-off studies among psychologists, sociologists, historians. Not really. Nope. Didn't do that. Um, because you would not have gotten IRB approval for something that would have been similar, very similar to the Milgram study. It, it, you wouldn't have got it because of the risk of psychological harm. So um, that's not accurate. And again, it's a, it's a hot potato. And it's, uh, there's a quote here from The Atlantic saying, but as with human memory, the study even published, archived, and trained in psychology textbooks uh, is malleable. And in the past few years, a new wave of researchers have dedicated themselves to reshaping it, which researchers shouldn't do. You don't go back and reshape history because, again, you don't have that context of that of, of history. You don't, you don't go back and reshape it to, to fit what you want it to fit now. 
arguing that Milgram's lessons on human obedience are in fact misremembered. Well, that's we know there's a forgetting curve I talked about in the last podcast. That his work doesn't prove what it claims to. Yes, it does. It proves exactly what it's supposed to prove. Um, there's a stu- there was a study, it, it went on to mention in 2013 that there was a, 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 a lady who interviewed a number of participants in the Milgram experiment and then wrote up about, you know, what they remembered from that. Well, well, okay, here's the deal. I mean, why, why, why do that? <laughs> because, one, you have the forgetting curve. Um, second, those participants, um, are, you, you have so much memory distortion that's going to happen over 50 years. The other part of that is, um, it, it's, again, it, it, it's, just, it's just crazy. But... Um, you're going to have to probably lead a lot of the questioning, like you know, did you did you feel that um, you know it was wrong to, you know, press that button and maybe hurt that? Other? Oh yeah, yeah, I felt it was wrong. I felt it was wrong. You know, so no, I mean you you can say what was it like to participate? A lot of people probably are. I mean honestly, you're going to remember some things like yeah, I, re- I remember um, yeah, I, re- I remember Milgram. Yeah, like for one year he wore a short sleeve suit. Really, really was kind of hip, and after that, you know, it wasn't in fashion. Um, yeah, I remember, um, yeah, he brought us pizza. Oh, wait a second, no, that was when I got home from the study. My roommates and I went out for pizza. Um, yeah, I remember, I mean, it's going to be, you're going to have this mismatch of memory. So if anything, it's a, it's an interesting story to say, what was it like to participate in, in this? And then over time, as you learn more about it, you know, what you know what did you think that people ask you questions whatever but outside of that useless um stephen reicher r-e-i-c-h-e-r professor of psychology university of st andrews and co-editor of the journal of social issues special edition refers to milgram's work as his studies are fantastic little pieces of theater okay that's condescending um and yeah don't don't say that what a mess what a mess um Yale University possesses archives containing boxes upon boxes of papers, video, audio, audio recordings from Milgram, some that should have probably been destroyed post-study. Usually after you gather information from your research participants and your study has been published, you don't hold on to that information, um, or you, you destroy any coding affiliation with it to the, you know, to the point um, that it's not going to be useful to anyone else. You know, it could be there for a short amount of time if you needed to go back and ask some clarifying questions. But uh, we talked about that that research uh, researcher from Madison. His name was Matthew Hollander, sociology candidate. Again, Matthew, I appreciate the work that you've done that that, that you've done on this. Um, not at all meant to be a criticism of you at all. Uh, what's happening though is the Atlantic is taking a segment of your work and then kind of framing that out as, oh, here, I mean, he's on to the great understanding of how um, we can, you know, have exercise acts of, um, you know, defiance and in, in, in verbal, you know, verbally, you know, declining participation in such events. So um, it doesn't do you uh, benefit to then have the Atlantic put your research in a light like this, because one now, it, it holds you up to a standard. I don't know what your, your ultimate findings were, but um, of, you know, you, you had to solve everything. You had to solve what the Nuremberg trials couldn't. So uh, I, I feel for you, Matthew. I appreciate your work. Um, and dun, 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 the Atlantic, in some ways, the conclusions that Milgram drew were as much a product of their time as we are product of, as they were a product of research. Well, yes. Today we refer, refer to this as situationalism, an idea that people behave is determined upon what's happening around them. Yes, I talked about that, like with mom and Telly. So again, like the Atlantic would will will say it will contradict itself like all over the place on this. Just it, it's just crazy. Again. The bullet statement, the ability to dissipate toxic orders is a skill that can be learned like any other. Um, a per, all a person needs to do is learn what to say. No, no, there's nothing in the research to support that. And it assumes the authority figure is open to verbal reasoning or other types of reasoning. So just, just, just crazy. Um, yeah. We need to educate children on recognizing situations and navigating uh, uh, away from 
from those situations as early as possible that aren't going to serve their best interest. That's from me. And the Milgram study, I think, teaches that identification of when you're not feeling um, that, that you're comfortable with something. And then the real question there is how you work with people like in that Milgram study, if they're not comfortable with something, and then enabling them on how to, to leave, um, which I think is where Matthew Hollander wanted to start to go and never, I don't know where he went, where he got there, but um, we're, what Matthew's talking about, and, and this whole thing is kind of getting at sense making or recognizing when something is different from the norm and then what your options are to respond to that. So getting toward the end, our headline, I'm going to go through this one quickly. South Carolina arming school staff, Fox 32 Chicago, November 17, 2016. It's an article published in um, Illinois, but it's about South Carolina. A state representative there, Joshua Putnam, is drafting legislation for teachers to take up arms in schools. That was done after the shooting. You probably remember it of the young boy. Uh, they had the eulogy, the superhero eulogy. Uh, Batman actually gave um, the, the eulogy, which is interesting because Batman doesn't carry a gun and won't use a gun. Um, but so I'm going to convey. Um, I, I, I am not um, taking a position on guns, but what I'm saying is this is this has a very similar feel to what happened after Sandy Hook. And what happened after Sandy Hook were 450 bills were put into to, to state legislatures uh, regarding school safety. Most of those had to do either with arming staff or fortifying buildings. Um, very, very little, if anything, had to do with helping um, either mental health or helping to try to improve leakage detection systems or what were the early indicators where if this could have been detected and even prevent it. Like, so that's what's missing in this whole article is what was the prioritization matrix or the, or the process or of how did this become the priority uh, versus also looking at that leakage detection system or putting um, equal or more resources into that. I can tell you that one thing is we think about shooting, school shootings. School shootings, yes. But we look at nice France where a vehicle was used to, to plow down and kill people. We look at exploding drones. Um, it's, it's much more expansive than just a school shooter. And to be frank, where I think things are going, uh, I think things are trending toward ve vehicles being used as tools um, to inflict uh, mass casualty. So, and in those cases, you know, you, you, your, your teacher carrying a gun and those type of things is not going to be as effective. I, I read a, in an article about the Gabby Gifford shooting, and a lot of people in the audience conceal and carry, had their own weapons, pull them out, and instantly, like, they weren't quite sure who was the shooter and who was just another person pulling out their gun. So, you know, I attended high school where we, deer, during deer hunting season, there were probably, you know, 75 pickup trucks with deer racks, and shotguns and rifles and everything was unlocked. It's, it's the way it was in northern Wisconsin. That was okay. It was okay for the context. Um, but what I'm saying right here is this is where people kind of jump to. And if you're a parent in South Carolina, uh, one is, you know, is this really what you want? Do you, do you want your teachers armed? And outside of that question is, how about that early detection and leakage detection system and threat input system? What are we doing with that? That's a question that needs to be asked. That's where we get into things like Spragio. Um, so, uh, dun, 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 recap. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to my supporters, Spragio, ISS 24-7, and the 405 Media. Um, again, our next podcast, uh, we'll have Scott Myers talking about NFL stadium security, which has changed significantly, become very, very complicated, um, but very manageable by ISS 24-7. I guess very sophisticated would be the word. And just um, help you to understand that of, of what's going on to keep you safe when you're watching the big game. So please follow me on YouTube, on SoundCloud, subscribe on Twitter. Anywhere else, pass out the good word here about the safety doc. Until our next podcast, stay safe.